No. Hello, my fellow Westorians. Welcome back to History of Westeros podcast. We've been off the live streams for a little while. Time to get back in the game and continue a little bit with what we talked about on the future of Duncan Egg and our Blackfire and Blood Raven content. Basically, an offshoot of some of those things, maybe a hmm, an important chapter in Westerosi history that's not that long ago. We're discussing an event that was hmm, 65 years before the start of the book, so about 67, 68 years away now. Uh, it's called the Peak Uprising, and it wasn't the event so much that was important, but who died there? It was the death of King Makar, but not just him, and that caused all sorts of problems for the realm and a lot of characters that we're familiar with. Makar's realm, uh, rather, reign, was also very interesting and has a lot of unusual parallels to what's going on in the current story. It was set up very early in the story, uh, meaning it was mentioned early in the Game of Thrones, so, you know, George considered it important pretty early on. And to discuss all these great topics and a lot more, we have brought back returning guest Stephen Atwell, who is... Are one of our main men when talking about this type of stuff, these topics, and all related topics. Welcome back, Stephen. Good to have you. Thank you. Good to be back. Right on. So what have you been doing over at Race for the Iron Throne or and or any other projects you want to mention? This is a good time to do it. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, I just uh, did the uh, Purple Wedding. Ooh. Second longest chapter in all of the books, or third longest, I forget. One of the longest ones, and a very important. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So you all you all will want to check that out. Uh, lots of analysis on the Purple Wedding. Good to check that out for sure and see what Stephen has to say. Also want to shout out Nina, whose uh, notes and thoughts are in our episode, as usual. Not a surprise to hear that, I'm sure, for most of you. Uh, over on goodqueenally.tumblr.com, that's Allie with one L. She's been taking some really interesting questions. That's a regular feature she has over there, getting asks and, and responding in great detail with thoroughness, as you would expect. For example, uh, a what-if question was asked recently about what if Ed Muir had been fostered by Ned? That would be kind of interesting because they... Their families are already connected on some levels. Also, she's asked about what kind of titles were used prior to the conquest. It couldn't have just been the same things like High Lord and obviously they were kings, but what would you call, say, the Prince of the Vale? What was the name of that? Surely they had an official title. George hasn't given those. So it's kind of fun to play around with that idea and see what's out there. Mm -hmm. But getting back to this. Uh, we have one other important announcement before we get started today. I want to give a th thank you and shout out to all of our patrons and people who support us uh, in other spots as well. Today, during this live stream, we're going to be giving away a $50 Patreon membership indefinite length from Thomas Pappas and fam. That's the TKOK podcast man. That's Hema Helminth. He's uh, one of our biggest supporters and a friend, and he offered to do this as kind of a hol holiday giveaway. <laughs> And we're obviously excited to be able to do that. So to enter, if you're here listening to this live stream, email Westeros History Giveaway at gmail.com. That's Westeros History Giveaway, one word, at gmail.com. And we will draw a random winner about halfway through the episode. If you're already a patron, you're still eligible. We'll just bump your pledge up by 50 instead of adding a new $50 pledge. So that's pretty exciting. Stick around for that. And if you have questions on this topic, either already or if something comes up while we're discussing it, fire away. We'll, we'll pause twice during the episode to take questions and see what happens. Okay, so to start off, just a few basics and then we'll get right to it. I'm calling this or we're calling a sort of a side effect of the Blackfire Rebellions. We don't actually know that for sure. It just seems really likely given the peaks were super involved in all the Blackfire Rebellions and lots of other shenanigans throughout Westerosi history. They're not exactly important these days, but they were for a long time. A couple of other themes like how honor, how following the rules can actually be a recipe for disaster when the rules are not well made in the first place, that is. Good rules are good to follow. An honor leading to needless death. For example, in this one, they held out this siege for honor, right? The, the peaks had lost, basically, but they kept holding out. And then the king was killed, and then everyone gets killed. So it's all these things could have been avoided. <laughs> That's one of the things we'll be talking about. And because all those people were killed, well, it caused a bunch of success and crises, not just at the Iron Throne, but 
in other major houses. And that's really important. The trouble of terrible errors comes up here as well. It's part of it's one of the succession crises. It's a style of succession crises, we could say. And we're going to finish off with parallels to Stannis, including ideas on his death. Uh, Stephen and I have talked about this before, but not really in an episode. So this will be fun. We'll get to throw a few parallels and some uh, theories about what's coming. So, uh, Stephen, what is your kind of overview? What are your, do you have your basic headcanon on what really happened with the Peak Rebellion? I mean, it's such a shadowy event. Like I said at the beginning, it's more about who died than what happened. But just as an overview, I'd like to hear your kind of your first thoughts on, on the situation and, and this event. Yeah, it seems to have been uh, a failed attempt to provoke uh, a fourth Blackfire Rebellion ahead of schedule. Yeah, maybe like um, three years before. We'll be clear on that. It was three years before the actual fourth Blackfire Rebellion, in case that wasn't clear to y'all. Uh, and there's some possibility. I mean, I've, I've theorized that it might have been a sort of a targeted assassination attempt on Makar as an attempt to spur a succession crisis. I definitely like that theory, too, and it's in our list of things to talk about because, uh, you know, folks, if you think about it, Makar, well, you might be like, well, how do you kill a warrior king out in the field? Isn't that harder? Well, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be easy in any case, <laughs> but this is a guy surrounded by Kingsguard and the Raven's Teeth. Remember how the rumors are how locked down the Red Keep was? That was in Ares's time, but I'm, I'm sure Makar probably appreciated tight security, too. So, yeah, like, how, how else would you do something like that? So I, I like that idea. Um, well, let's, let's take a few uh, basics about the reign of Makar to sort of set some of these things up and get, uh, lay out some groundwork here. He was the 14th king, Makar was. He was. His brother Ares was the 13th king. That's, of course, Ares I, not the Mad King, obviously. He was the fourth son of Daron the Good, who was the 12th king, and so thus the grandson of the infamous Aegon the Unworthy, who was the 11th king. Now, he wasn't really like any of them. <laughs> He's a little bit like Aegon the Unworthy in the, in the realm was worried about the succession. But personality-wise, no, not even a little bit, and, and not really much like the other guys either. Here's a quick quote. The chief issue of Makar's reign was the question of his heirs. He had a number of sons and daughters, but there were those who had reason to doubt their fitness to rule. Okay, is that an understatement or no? I mean, we're talking Aryan bright flame, dare on the drunker. What do you mean reason to doubt their fitness to rule? That sounds like a big understatement, doesn't it? Yeah. Um... You know, I think this was a circumstance where the personal qualities of the king were overshadowed by the personal qualities of his heirs. Mm. So that's uh, yet one one of many things that reminds us of Stannis, I suppose. Although Stannis doesn't have heirs so much as something's wrong with Shireen, but she doesn't strike you as necessarily a great leader. She doesn't necessarily have that personality. She's a good kid. She's smart. But I don't know about king queen material. Uh, maybe it's a little early to say, given her age, but definitely Arian and Daron and a maester aren't king material. And Egg turned out to be a pretty good king, at least from the perspective of most readers. But, you know, it's kind of like that TV show, Everyone Hates Chris or Everyone Hates Raymond. Everyone or everyone loves Raymond. They don't like Egg, that he was very unpopular. So even though we think he's good, we have to keep that in mind that the rest of the realm wasn't so excited about the possibility of him being that. And we have a little timeline wonkiness here, don't we? There's not, it's not quite clear when certain characters died. We have Makar's Realm starting in 221. At some point, Daron died, and then Arian became the heir. Now, if we go with Nina's thinking here, Daron marries Kiera around 219, and that's Kiera of Tyrosh, the same Kiera who married uh, Valar, Baylor's uh, mm -hmm. son. So this was like a remarriage situation. Daron and Kira did have a child, but she was simple-minded. And you know how Westeros is about uh, putting women on the throne, so they weren't excited about that either. So we're not sure if Daron died later in Makar's reign or early, but it kind of makes sense that it would be midway through because Arian married Daenora around the middle of Makar's reign. Daenora was the third child of Rhaegel and 
his Aaron wife. I think that was Alice Aaron. And so you have a first cousin marriage set up here. And with that, well, it looked like a royal marriage. It looked like the line that would continue. You've got two members of two branches of the ruling family united. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and we don't know what kind of person she was. But then all of a sudden, Arian dies in 232. And instead of a the type of succession crisis where people are worried about well, that guy's going to rule us. I don't, you know, you're not excited about Joffrey taking over. You're not excited about certain awful people taking the reins, but what about when it goes from that to just, well, who's it going to be? So Stephen, let's talk about that for a minute. What's the difference from the realm's perspective when they're worried about who the ruler is going to be because he's a terrible person versus when they just don't know at all who it's going to be. And there's lots of possibilities, which might mean civil war. So yeah, kind of damned either way, huh? Yeah, and in some ways, the the latter is worse. That you know, with someone that is unpopular, you know, they're they're bad, but at least they're a known quantity. When you're facing the prospect of an infant king and a very long regency, that just is as close as you come to pure chaos yeah yeah it's bad it's bad so this is kind of a dysfunctional family i, I like to mention the show succession because it's an hbo show i actually haven't seen it i don't know <laughs> i don't know much about it but it seems like the kind of thing we're talking about where you've got someone who's pretty capable but the people that he's got to pass it down to are not maybe they're capable or isn't it maybe, isn't it maybe it's not their capacity that's in question although it is in some cases it's their personality it's their ethics some of them are just bad people i'm not sure that's an issue in succession but it would be you know in a general scenario of, of this type um and it's not the kind of thing that we think about as normal people we think about rent and jobs and family people like us do we think about who am I going to pass my great wealth on to? I'm not worried about who I'm passing my company or my country on to. I mean, it's a real thing, but most of us don't have that issue to think about. And, but it is really important with a king, with a kingdom. I mean, like you said, it's arguably worse to have an uncertain succession than a bad king. Because let's look at what happened with Ares. Ares was a bad king, but most of the common folk didn't care he didn't bother them he didn't torture them he didn't burn them he didn't to from their perspective he was he could have been a lot worse he wasn't magor because magor was actually out there murdering peasants all the time but Ares wasn't he was mostly murdering other lords <laughs> so uh these things are weird it's hard to think about Ares as being less of a bad guy but in this type of scenario you might rather have Ares than Joffrey, for example, they're both terrible, but Joffrey actually picks on, you know, as far as we know, he was more about targeting uh, uh, more of a bully, like picking on people who couldn't help themselves. I don't think Ares cared about that so much. I think he picked on he was more paranoid about other powerful people. Is that does that register with you or did you would you look at it a little differently? Um, I mean, Joffrey. Joffrey certainly targeted violence at the small folk. But it was mostly the small folk of King's Landing. Yeah, that's true. So as long as you weren't in the capital, you know, he was very unpopular with the small folk of the capital. Um, that's true. You know, hence, hence the, the King's Landing riot. Um, but outside the capital, you know, he didn't really negatively affect, you know, except for the the war that was going on. Yeah. You know, he wasn't directly causing uh, much harm to the small folk. Um, you know, Aaron Bright Flame, I think could have gone either way. Depend, you know, we certainly saw with um, uh, Danelle Tutal yeah, or Tensel, or excuse me, Tensel, Tensel yeah, yeah. too tall. Um, that he he was perfectly willing to uh, exercise violence against the small folk, but it seemed relatively targeted at you know singers and 
you know, other people who, you know, he wasn't causing wars, wars to, you know, so he wasn't starting wars. Like he may have done things that led to war, but he wasn't out to start wars. You know, he's just kind of stupid and cruel. And if you can contain yeah. that, well, there, like you said, it could, it could be a lot worse. It's obviously not what you aim for, but, <laughs> and that brings us on to another related topic. It's, it's ironic that one of the difficult, one of the, ways this is difficult or the the people who've thought about this the most are some of the worst characters we've we've seen uh Ruth bolton of all people describes this difficulty and we're not inclined to take advice from Ruth bolton but every once in a while you know even the worst people it's like uh, that thing on the internet you know the worst people the worst person you know has a great take you know <laughs> so, and that's here's an example of that R when Ruth says something like boy lords are the bane of any house i mean He's not wrong. He's basically saying teenagers aren't fit to run massive, complex organizations involving huge amounts of property and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Yeah, sure. Hard to argue with that. Roos isn't wrong. But then uh, he points out this conundrum. It gets a little more awkward. And that's where we're getting into parallels with Makar. You want to read this quote, Shay? So here's Roos talking to Theon. I forbade it, but Domeric was a man grown and thought that he knew better than his father. Now his bones lie beneath the dread fort with the bones of his brothers, who died still in the cradle, and I am left with Ramsay. Tell me, my lord, if the Kinslayer is accursed, what is a father to do when one son slays another? The question frightened him. Yeah, it's awkward for Theon, too, clearly. I mean, it is a frightening question. It is kind of a, a tough question. But it's also sneaky because Theon knows from history that Greyjoy brothers kill each other from time to time. But he doesn't know how true it is in current times. His own uncle is running around killing all sorts of brothers. Are you supposed so Roos's question doesn't have isn't actually given a good answer here. What are you supposed to do? to an heir that is cursed by the gods according to the own laws of your own culture. What is Rue supposed to do about that? I don't know. There isn't a good answer. Exile isn't necessarily going to work. I mean, people come back. I mean, the Blackfires did exactly that. Um, they weren't exactly exiled. They ran away. But it's the same difference. You know, if you, if you, if, if you leave them alive, they can come back with armies or dragon horns. <laughs> so what, what do you think, Stephen? Like, in the real world, is it just it's just a constant problem, isn't it? It's just an inherent flaw with monarchy or, or what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think it is, uh, as sort of systemic problem with monarchy that, you know, the, the very security of primogenitor, right. That sort of says exactly who, um, should rule means that like you're kind of stuck with um your your choice of heir and if they're not suitable there's nothing you can do about it really without causing a huge amount of chaos you know trying to disinherit somebody is a good way to get a civil war going and killing them is obviously even worse, given the laws of your society, unless you unless you get away with that without anyone knowing. But that's what Roos brings up the point about the gods. Like, well, if the gods are watching, then you can't even get away with doing it on the down low. And then you've doomed yourself or your whole house. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, it, it brings up it's, it's kind of off topic, but it brings up what Euron says. It's like, well, that's why there are no gods we know because i've done all these awful things and i haven't suffered for it lots of people have kin slayed and haven't been punished for it so well, that's another topic but it's part of why it's part of where that conclusion comes from i mean it maybe takes a psycho like Euron to re reach that conclusion in a society like this but it was kind of a data-driven experiment <laughs> he looked at the results and said yeah well uh i'm still here and that's something kind of interesting about the characters we're talking about in this episode We've got Euron's the Kinslayer. Ramsey's maybe going to be a Kinslayer if he isn't already, have, hasn't all killed his brother. Makar killed Baylor, right? So he, our mm -hmm. main subject is a Kinslayer. Stannis' face was on the shadow that killed Renly, since we're talking parallels. Stannis' 
maybe a pseudo kin slayer in a way. I don't know how you call that. With when magic's involved, I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what the rules are, but still, I think he applies certainly. Arian, as we discussed during Third Blackfire Rebellion talk, he might be the one that killed Hagon, and that's sort of kin slaying. That's a cousin of his, and and who knows what else Arian? It's did. a breach of it's a breach of the laws of war at at best. Yeah, you're right. So even if it's not kin slaying, it was really bad. We're going to talk about Gerald the Golden later in this episode. He is almost certainly a kinslayer. He probably killed his, his own brother, if not his niece or both. Uh, so that's pretty bad. And uh, Roos, of all the, again, Roos is the guy. Is he the good guy here? No, he's not the good guy here. But he's the only one who doesn't appear to be a kinslayer out of all these characters we've talked about. So that's kind of funny. Uh, so, yeah, what was Makar supposed to do? What was the realm supposed to do? It's a different. These are different questions. You know, the Westeros at least has the wall, which is an option, but even that isn't certain. I mean, so it seems like what happened was Makar just, yeah, Makar is a, a rule follower. If we're sticking with our Stannis parallels, he's not going to shake up the system. He's not the kind of guy to do that. He'll follow the, the, the rules a little too strictly, if anything. So he just, it's what our best guess is that he just went ahead with, yep, yeah, Arian's going to be next. He's going to be king next. That's all there is to it. I'm not going to break the system. I'm not going to change anything. That's just how it is. And uh, that could cause quite a bit of anxiety, depending on how long this was a state of affairs. Like, if, if Arian was the heir for five years in a row, yikes. I mean, the whole realm's going to be like, uh... <laughs> and then Arian and Daenora going on and have a child named Magor? I mean, that's not going to help the anxiety. That's going to make it worse. Uh... For all we know, Daenora was nothing like Arian, but heck, she might have been like him. She might have been the one to name the kid Magor. <laughs> Probably not, but hey, you never know. You never know. Well, and then there's also Vaela. There's what? So, Daron had a daughter. Right, yeah. So, you know, there is an argument that she has the right to rule. So one of the things that's that's true is like, you know, with so many of these candidates, um, you know, there's something hovering over their head where there's another candidate in the wings who could claim precedence ahead of them. Yeah, or like imagine this girl has her own child, a boy, five or six years later then all of a sudden this kid's like hey i have a claim to the throne i'm i'm through the first line of this branch um and if enough people support the kid then you've got the potential for civil war so yeah there's it's very perilous like we said makar's reign had this hanging over it the whole time who's going to inherit arian and then who's going to inherit we don't know both are really awful scenarios now, Arian is someone we'll explore in greater depth elsewhere. He's a pretty interesting character, despite being pretty evil. But uh, his death was in 232, so a year before the peak uprising. And, of course, the old famous wildfire drinking incident, still famous now, probably still famous later. I mean, it is a pretty sensational story. That's the kind of tabloid-type story that, if it really happens, is the kind of thing that stays famous for a long time. So... You've got all these dead Targaryens. Makar outlived a lot of his own family. His grandchildren are kind of a mess or too young. I mean, let's be honest. This Magor kid, we never hear about what happened to him. He, he probably died young or something like that. There is no way they're going to put a child on the throne, especially when he's there, that child, the child of Arian. Maybe the kid, you know, by the time he's 10 or 12, shows up, okay, this kid isn't like his father. But you can't take that gamble that far in advance let alone having a child king that's a double whammy isn't it steve and having a an unknown person yeah and, and a kid or a baby <laughs> you know unfortunately it's a kid who's sort of set up to have an evil reputation yeah you know he's got his father to you know the the memory of his father to contend with and if matters weren't worse enough already he's saddled with the name of the worst targaryen <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you know he would have been treated as ill-omened pretty much from the get-go. It's almost like he's a the way Westeros would treat a bastard. You know, bastards are born of of lust and, and envy and all these other things. And, and it 
they blame the child for in, for having those things. Now, obviously, Magor was trueborn, but he has that. It's the same sort of blemish from your parents uh, that you the child has absolutely no control over, and it's very unfair to pin that on them. But yeah, we don't know anything about this kid. He he must have he, he may have died young or just become a non-factor or who knows. Uh, he he really just disappears from the history. But uh, Nina suggests that maybe Makar would hope for Egg to be regent to young Magor. Because Makar wasn't going to push young Magor aside. He didn't do that. That didn't happen until the Great Council. And everybody kind of collectively went, yeah, definitely not the one-year-old kid named Magor. It doesn't seem to have been much of an argument. Uh, Makar wasn't old, but he wasn't young. I mean, he was a pretty healthy guy, I guess. You know, big dude, uh, warrior. 55 to 59 is the age range we have on here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he obviously was strong enough to go to war. He went he and was in the front. So clearly uh, either his pride kept him up there or he really did have the ability or somewhere in between. Uh, and you think that yeah, was probably but he wasn't, wasn't lasting longer than another 10, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. And so which makes ahead. it difficult because it means that whoever the you know, if a child is born now, even if Makar had survived the peak uprising, yeah, they would be young and untested when they took the throne. Mm -hmm. So, if the succession is the chief issue of Makar's reign, and we have little reason to doubt that, it's in the world of ice and fire, and it's a recent thing. It's only set, like I said, less than seventy years ago, and we have people who were alive during that time a uh, Pycelle lived during uh, Makar's reign obviously so did Maester Aemon that's his dad so of course but uh, point being though it couldn't have been the only issue Makar's reign couldn't have been only about the succession that couldn't have been the only problem until the peak uprising there had to be other things and part of the reason we're we're, we're guessing around here is we're trying to get an idea of what might have caused the uprising sure there's unrest and unhappiness with with the targaryens because the peaks are blackfire supporters that's a part of it but as far as looking for maybe a trigger or a set of triggers or some reason for them to be upset we're forced to guess but we have some decent ideas so let's go through a few of these and chat them out of course blood raven being hand a lot of people didn't like him now picture that you've got that alone tells you something. You've got Makar, who's a Stannis parallel. You got Blood Raven, who's a, a kind of a hardliner, secret police guy, not very forgiving. So put those two guys together, eh, it might have been kind of a harsh, like kind of an unforgiving administration. Yeah, yeah. I get that. I get yeah, that I sense pretty strongly. Think, what do you think about that? I I I definitely think that there was not a lot of second chances being offered um and quite a bit of sort of vindictiveness Ooh, yeah. i mean especially in the wake of the third rebellion you know which seems to have come the closest to succeeding you know, I imagine there were lots of Blackfire supporters. Yeah, there had to be, yeah, right? They couldn't have all been killed, right? Yeah. Around. Um, it gives you an idea, like, of what Stannis, like, we talk about Stannis talking about wanting to ban brothels or do all these other kind of things. It was like, he apparently those were things he actually mentioned. He was never actually king on the Iron Throne, probably won't ever be, but... It's been talked about a lot what kind of king he would be, because a lot of people really like the idea of Stannis being king, especially given the other options. And so it's something that the fandom has thought about a lot, like what would a Stannis regime look like? Well, for one thing, he wouldn't have, uh, it might be balanced out a bit, because he wouldn't have a Blood Raven as hand. Uh, Melisandre as an advisor might be a problem, but Davos' hand is much different than, than Blood Raven. So that at least would be yeah. different. But the whole the whole like banning brothels thing that kind of that's like a, a great example of i don't know if they were if littlefinger was exaggerating about that one it sounds like he wasn't though it sounds like Sanders really wanted to was really considering that and that's the kind of thing you, you think of when some, a ruler who's too harsh too unforgiving you know they wouldn't be throwing parades in his honor he might commission a parade but they wouldn't be like happy about it. you know what i mean like that this isn't a guy who engenders love 
He's probably not very popular, mm -hmm. and neither are the other people in his administration. So, yeah. Might have been worse than Stannis. So there's a Ned Pycelle conversation from really early on that I mentioned that sets up some of the stage here. There was this, as we mentioned in the future of Duncan Egg episode, there was a super summer from 223 slash 224 all the way to around 230, 231-ish, followed by a really bad winter, and the winter is when the uprising happened. And here is a quote from Pycelle to describe that. To be sure, King Makar's summer was hotter than this one, and near as long. There were fools, even in the Citadel, who took that to mean that the great summer had come at last, the summer that never ends. But in the seventh year, it broke suddenly, and we had a short autumn and a terrible long winter. Still, the heat was fierce while it lasted. Old Town steamed and sweltered by day, and came alive only by night. So that's Eddard Five. So like I said, pretty early on, and mm -hmm. that's him talking about how bad it was. And the reason that's important is because, yeah, he says King Makar's summer was hotter than this one. Wow. Like, of course, that's just Pycelle's memory of it. It may not have really been. But that just goes to show how similar the weather situation was, the summer-winter situation was. We're talking about all these similarities. That's a huge one um, because it's the same things are happening. You've got... The summer ends right before A Song of Ice and Fire starts. It gets talked about as, oh boy, the winter's going to be really bad. Sure enough, it's just getting started. We, we haven't really seen the full extent of it, but it looks pretty bad. It's, it's, hitting, uh, it's already hitting the Riverlands, and we'll see. It's obviously causing huge blizzards around where Stannis actually is. So I think that's pretty important. Um, do you have anything to to add to this winter summer parallel, Stephen, or is that something you've? Yeah, I for? mean, you know, I I think it could be another like one of the sort of lists of catalysts of the peak uprising mm. that you know we've seen with Robert uh, and also with um, with Eris that long summers token goodwill towards the monarch. Mm. It may have been one of the few things, like few sources of popularity that Makar had. Good point. Uh, and then it suddenly goes away. And then there's a terrible long winter. So it could have been one of those, you know, mandate of heaven kind of issues that the peaks raise that, you know, that's a great point because it's well established that the realm complained about the great spring sickness and the drought before that, and they blamed it on Blood Raven, who was still the hand of the king. So they could pretty they could drag up a lot of that those old grievances and say, "Look, it's happening again. Same reason, same problem, same flaws, same leader, same mandate from heaven." So yeah, I like the mandate from heaven phrase is pretty perfect for this. It would also have a logistical effect, though, huh? Like. During summer, it's easier to feed an army. During winter, well, not so much. But if you're in the Reach and the peaks are in the southern portion of the Reach, the Dornish Marches, that's one of the areas least affected by winter. So they might sit there thinking, well, you know, it looks like a lot of the realm is pretty hammered by winter. We're not doing that bad. So maybe that was part of their thinking. Does that does that register with you? Do you think that would make sense, or is there something? I'm I mean, it certainly makes sense how they thought that they could hold off a royal army. It's a lot more expensive and difficult to keep a besieging army out in the field than it is to keep a garrison, a castle garrison, fed. So they may have thought, well, we can outlast him during the winter. Yeah. And then, you know, when the people see that the king is defeated, then, you know, they'll rise up against him sort of thing. That's a great point. Yeah. And along with that, it, surely it wasn't just that. We're not trying to look for, since we don't have a single trigger that we know of, we're looking for a variety of reasons, which is more likely than just one reason. That's, that's generally how it is. It isn't usually just one offense. It can be. It can be, certainly. But given we don't have one, we're, we're looking for a variety of reasons. So here's another example. Here's another thing that might have played in to the Peak's decision. 
It's another line from Picel, but here we're jumping forward to a feast for crows at Tywin's funeral. Sir Jamie, I have seen terrible things in my time, the old man said. Wars, battles, murders most foul. I was a boy in Old Town when the Grey Plague took half the city and three quarters of the citadel. Lord Hightower burned every ship in port, closed the gates, and commanded his guards to slay all those who tried to flee, be they men, women, or babes in arms. They killed him when the plague had run its course. On the very day he reopened the port, they dragged him from his horse and slit his throat and his young sons as well. So if you're the Peaks, you're sitting there going, well, Old Town's pretty weak too. They might not be able to help the king either. They're, the high towers are might be in flux. You got the king or the the Lord High Tower and his son were murdered by the city, the city he rules. Doesn't sound like they're going to bring much of an army to the field either. So you got the most powerful house that's not in the that's outside the range of winter that's also been hammered pretty badly. So the Grey Plague takes out Old Town, or at least maybe takes them off the board. You got winter taking out a whole bunch of other factors. All of a sudden, maybe you start to see why the peaks might have not been so dumb after all because it looks bad in retrospect doesn't it, it looks like yeah. they just horribly screwed up because it, it the first thing we ever find out about this war is there's a siege of their capital or of their castle star pike so it sounds like it went from bad to worse really quickly uh, because this all happened within one year it couldn't possibly have been very drawn out because of the time that we're dealing with here mm -hmm. One thing about the Great Plague that's interesting is the parallel with the Great Spring Sickness. Yeah. Which is, you know, yet again, another mandate from heaven issue. Another sign that the gods are angry. Um, but also something that discombobulates the realm. You know, you got to imagine if Old Town is suffering like this, then probably Lannisport and King's Landing... Uh, you know, decent chance they got hit um, by it too. Yeah, or a little bit in Gull Town and so forth. Yeah, good point. Are all suffering as well. So, you know, they might have imagined that the royal response would be hampered by, you know, pandemic re reaction. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And then you, especially with that mention of so many of the so many people in the citadel being killed now you already have a lot of maesters out in the world doing their thing but that had to impact the maybe it was more of a long-term issue but the the fact that so many of the students that were going to be maesters later were killed then well there's going to be a shortage of there's going to be a supply chain issue of maesters coming mm -hmm. forward there's just not enough young maesters in training so that might be something that came along later but it certainly might have played a role. You may have had to shuffle some maesters around. They may have had to bring some people back. Who knows? It's uh, like you said, it would have been not a standard situation. It would have been an abnormal state of affairs. Mm -hmm. So the uprising happens in 233. Again, we don't know what the final trigger was with the final straw that broke the camel's back. We're not sure. Like we said, it's probably a bunch of things, confluence of factors. So this is 12 years after Makar was crowned and 14 years after the third Blackfire Bounty. So not that close to those events. Not super far, but quite a bit later. Um, roughly the same length between Blackfire 1 and 2, actually. Uh, Blackfire 2 was more like 16 years later, but it also wasn't a full rebellion. Yeah, like this one. So we also don't know the full degree of participation of the Peaks in the third Blackfire Billion. They probably participated. It seems likely, right? But we don't know how much. And given that they likely did, though, not unlikely they got some sanctions. Some more sanctions, more than they already got. Losing two castles after the first Blackfire Billion. Losing Gorman Peak's head after the second one. There must have been some punishment. Again, we're talking about Blood Raven here. Not Makar, though. Keep that in mind, folks. Blackfire 3 was during the reign of Ares, who was a lot milder after all he's the one who said yeah let's just let bitter still go to the wall that seems fine that didn't work out but hey uh so what do you think about that the idea that some sort of sanction laid on them would have played a role here some sort of tax burden or penalty or something that they were still steaming over it seems kind of likely right yeah possibly hostages Ooh, hostages good point yeah 
Didn't think uh, about especially that. if the hostages died during the Great Plague. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like another like a kind of a replay of, of what happened with the spring sickness. Yeah, because that was a big trigger for the Blackfire 2 was all the hostages were dead. So they no longer were sacrificing their own family members by rising up. So, yeah. 12 years. That's a great idea because we were talking, like we said, 12 years after Make Our Crown, 14 years later, whoever the hostages were may have passed by then. And it may have, like you said, may even be because of the sickness or the second sickness, that is. Uh, Nina makes a good comparison here, comparing the peak uprising to a little bit like what Oberyn tried to do after Robert's Rebellion. Remember, there was rumors that Oberyn sort of went around and tried to see what kind of support he could get for Viserys before John Aaron sort of got involved and talked that thing down, which, yeah, mm -hmm. like, good job, John Aaron. That wasn't going to go well for anyone, I don't think. Uh, how does that, that? I like this comparison a lot. It, it didn't go. The Peaks didn't have a John Aaron come talk them down. But it's pretty similar in that the the trigger might be sanctions. It might be past uh, grievances, blood debt. Like they probably might still be mad about Gorman Peaks' death. It might be his son in charge at this time uh, or his grandson, something like that. So we know how those Westerosi take blood debts pretty seriously even when the people they're mad about getting killed are the bad guy <laughs> in the first place or what have you uh so let's see here moving on um but we also see another pattern here that maybe just failed for them uh surely they expected people to join them they wouldn't they couldn't have even if they expected the realm was weaker even if they expected makar wouldn't have full support maybe they had a little bail on Greyjoy going on where they thought ah he doesn't have the realm behind him as much as he thinks uh, a very bad miscalculation on Balon's part possibly the same thing for the peaks here but that's basically what the current blackfire situation is right if we call young griff the blackfire situation which i think is fair to do even if you don't it's still the same thing they're landing with the gold company winning uh, trying to win a few victories to show everyone they're serious and win people to their side mm -hmm. maybe what we can assume here is that whole win a few victories to get people on their side part failed miserably they may just have not won those initial victories and it just just never got, got going. pushed back do you have any head cannon on what we think happened um it's a good question i mean it depends you know they could have gone for high garden Ooh, yeah Whoops, um, <laughs> they did. That's a mistake. <laughs> you know, that would be a sort of um, a possibility. They could have tried to raise up the Dornish marches in general. Mm. So looking for other, because we know that the, the marcher houses were um, on, on both sides of the reach Stormlands Dorn border were more likely to join with the Blackfires. Yeah. There's Dornish um, on both sides, of course, as we know, but there were more Dornish on the side of the of the loyalists. And at this point, you've got Makar who egg or all of Makar's kids are the double Dornishmen, right? Their mother was Dornish, their grandmother was Dornish. So that's that's an important factor. Right. So they may have been trying to rise, rouse up, um, uh, what you call it? The old anti dornish That's sort of a vulture there. king oh, style vulture king. Yeah. uprising. Yeah, good call. And that just failed. Seems pretty likely they were trying to lure Bittersteel over to come. Like if, like it's pretty much what the Gorman Peak was trying to do. He's like, yeah, once Bittersteel will come over once we get this going. Once he sees us winning, once we're succeeding, sure, he's not going to sit on the sidelines. He's not going to miss his chance to, to be on the winning side. Surely they expected him to come, but I wonder to what degree. Do you suspect they had communication at all, or do you think it was just uh, – I mean, obviously it's um, mostly I guesswork. I suspect some sort of communication, but – uh probably similar to the second rebellion that the peaks have a habit of assuming that they can engineer support out of thin air mm. by just going ahead and kind of committing themselves i wonder why that is you think that's because of their prior near ascendancy i mean they were it's it's hard to think about them this way now but the peaks were 
like a top 10 power in Westeros uh, back then. So maybe some of that is just they thought it used to be the way it was. They think this is still the old days when any peak says, let's go, people follow them. That's just, but it's just not yeah, like that anymore. I, I, think, <laughs> I think the recency of their fall from grace had maybe left them thinking that more pe- more of their former vassals mm. would side with them. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, you know, here's another idea from Nina. This is a good thought. She she thought she's along the lines of the Peaks banking on animosity por- towards Magor, uh, Makar himself or his family. One of the deeds she refers to that happened fairly uh, had to have happened before this because obviously it was during Makar's reign and this was the last thing he did because he died during this uprising was he took Heron Hall away from Half Lawston. Now, p- apparently that was this also is an event shrouded in mystery. It was apparently because Lady Danell Lawson turned to the dark arts, but there's already rumors she was involved in that before, and it's kind of sketchy that she even was. We don't really know, but it's possible that it was tyrannical or could be looked on as tyrannical. Taking a huge castle away from a family and giving it to another family, that isn't done very often, and this, especially without a, a real war behind it. There's no indication that they were traitors, so this was yeah i mean yeah. Danelle had been a staunch loyalist yeah they fought in the uh, yeah they they showed up at the blackfire too yeah they showed up to with their troops to to back up blood raven so yeah it's uh you could make the argument they turned on a loy on one on the one of their friends like yeah look at these targaryens they they turn on their own you know like there's all sorts of marketing <laughs> anti-targaryen marketing that the peaks could have been engaged in you can it writes itself right uh, even without mm-hmm. knowing the specifics so yeah, there's a lot of this, uh, a lot of this anti-Targaryen sentiment. I mean, there's another thing, really. One thing that I think is maybe lost in the shuffle, and maybe something that George R. R. Martin was just trying to set up as a subtle thing, is like there weren't very many good Targaryen kings at all, right? E- the entire run of Targaryen kings, only a few of them are pretty good, and the realm had suffered a lot of unclear successions or threatened reigns in a row. We talked about Makar's succession issues in his realm or in his time, but his great grandfather Viserys the second ruled for about a year, year and a half. Obviously a reign that short's not stable. You don't think of that as being stable prior to him. Uh, prior to Viserys, there were two Kings in a row who never had kids, Baylor and Daron the young dragon. That's Baylor the blessed. That is go back to more Kings and you're in the dance. <laughs> That's the least stable time of all. So then going forward, after Viserys II, the guy who was king for a year, year and a half, you got Aegon the Unworthy, the biggest screwer upper of future generations. Then you've got Daron, who was one of the pretty good ones. But his, like we talked about earlier, his his good run ended so ominously and painfully with Baylor's death just before it, then the sickness killing him and the heirs, and it looked real bad. Uh, and then you got King Aerys, who was not really a kingly type and also didn't have kids. So you just got a yeah. bunch of Targaryens not having kids, a bunch of Targaryens not and interested in Aelor ruling. And and Aelora's un- unstable. Yeah, so it's just a mess like someone like the peaks could look say look at this look at all this instability for generations and they might think that would work and well i guess it didn't uh but it's not a bad mm-hmm. argument <laughs> it's like you know what these targaryens really haven't done a great job here have they do you think that's a stretch or um would that be a selling point i mean i think it's probably the more recent stuff like i doubt that they went all the way back to viserys the second yeah <laughs> maybe not I think the the chaos from Ares the first onwards, they sort of were marketing. Yeah, like ever since the end of Daron's reign, it's been nothing but yeah, rebellions, plagues, nasty winter. Yeah, there's okay. So let's let's add some of this up. We know the the uprising failed really badly. So maybe they badly misjudged their support for a variety of reasons. The m- misjudging Makar's popularity, misjudging the impact of winter, misjudging uh, misjudging how weak Old Town was. Now, they could have gotten some of these things right and just any one of them could have gone wrong for them or just a couple of them went wrong for them. Um, 
And then we have all these other things we mentioned. So there's a lot of things. So, you know, from their perspective at the time, it might not have seemed so dumb. And, you know, we're looking at it in retrospect. So, I don't know. It's, it's easy to call it dumb, but maybe it was less dumb than it seemed. Certainly didn't work, though. Whatever it was, didn't work. Worked terribly. We quickly find ourselves um, with the siege situation. That's another thing, though, to keep in mind, though, before we get to the siege. What's at stake for House Peak? It's not just what's at stake of them losing. It's what their end achievement was, what they were hoping to win. Because if they win, if the Black Fires win, House Peak is basically the House Velaryon to the Targaryens, the number two house to yeah. that house. Or they're the Lannisters to Robert Baratheon, right? Yeah, I, I think they certainly saw themselves that way as as sort of first among equals. You think they maybe felt like they deserved it? Like someone like Unwin Peak definitely thought he deserved that sort of. <laughs> but uh, we haven't even mentioned Unwin yet, the, the king of all bad peaks, basically. <laughs> I mean, Gorman Peak certainly behaved that way. That's true. Yeah, they really, they really you have know, an attitude. Yeah. And and you saw he he had an attitude even with other Blackfires that That's he true. he thought That's that true. he could, you know, in effect, tell Bittersteel what to do. Yeah, like he could move Bittersteel like a pawn, basically. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, he has too much hmm, pride is not quite the right word, though. He definitely had too much of that, I guess. Maybe I guess it's just arrogance. It might just be straight up arrogance. I don't know. Maybe there isn't a better word than that. Yeah. <laughs> but it comes from these, his, these generations of belonging to this really powerful family and just all these expectations of privilege and success and maybe even a little bit of destiny mixed in their um you know foolish estimation of that but you know from their perspective that's what they think so earlier we talked about uh the idea that possibly they were going to target do a targeted assassination here i like that idea a lot let's talk about that i raised the issue of how difficult it would be to assassinate a king like this in the red keep given their tight what's likely pretty tight security um so why would they want to cause a succession crisis? Would that be to, to foist their own candidate on? Do you think maybe they were already thinking about Damon the Third, or maybe even Aenys Blackfire? I wonder. Yeah, yeah, that's a possibility. They may have thought that that the Blackfires could win a vote in a great council if the Targaryens were were sort of put in doubt. Mm. Um, but you know, another possibility is that they thought that. You know, they could essentially win this come from behind victory mm. that, you know, you kill the king, you leave chaos in his wake. There's no clear succession. Maybe the royal army just, you know, melts away. Or stands on the sideline, just doesn't know what to do. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, And that's also very much what the current again we're going to talk about the current black fires the plan of john con and, and illyrio and varus is create instability come in and be the solution and that's not unlikely what we're describing or not unlike what we're describing here it sounds like they were trying to increase the instability and then maybe be the solution to that instability uh even though there's mm -hmm. a part of the cause of it in the first place maybe it may exacerbate the pending instability they're like oh once Maycar dies, this is going to happen one way or another. We may as well speed that process up while we have some candidates ready to go. Because a few years from now, who knows? Maybe they, things will have changed. So maybe they thought this was their one chance. Mm -hmm. um, they may have already been banking on the the unpopularity of Egon, of Egg. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, now, I would guess Maycar didn't bring blood raven with him to the siege you rarely would have the king and hand be in the same place you need the hand probably to stay behind to run things but i, I wanted to throw that out there in case there's something i'm not thinking of do you would you agree with that or, or... yeah i mean i think Maycar is the would be something of a lead from the front micromanaging type yeah that you know he wants to be in charge of the battle so he wouldn't want blood raven second guessing him yeah that's a good point because <laughs> he'd also be like blood raven would want to make sure he was protected would be like dude don't stand in the front yeah i don't want him i'm not bringing blood raven he's gonna pester me about staying safe <laughs> the king's guard can do that enough but 
oh well i guess it didn't work <laughs> maybe blood raven's like yeah see that's why i should have been there <laughs> dumbass got smashed by a rock <laughs> how are you gonna let that happen man come on <laughs> uh so let's let's enter well, it's the downside of wearing a helmet with a crown on it you do make yourself something of a target oh, yes that's a good point remember how that was a thing in the discussion between uh tywin's or jamie's commanders when they're like it's easy to spot blackfish we'll get we'll shoot him with some some night soil arrows and once he's gone the, their defense will collapse yeah take out the key guy it may, you're right and the the crowned helm is a specifically mentioned feature of this not a lot of detail but it is absolutely mentioned that he had that crowned helm on and of course he would i mean he's the king he's gonna have his crown but you're right to point that out as something that's very visible um so let's let's consider some ideas besides the targeted killing though the idea that they expected him to die um maybe there was something like a i don't know a marriage like they were expecting maybe the the way this was all put to rest was a young peak daughter is going to marry or a son is going to marry say kiera uh kiera and daron's daughter maybe that's too high of a marriage for them given their treason but it's not out of the line of possibility, or maybe maybe they were going to marry a lesser child. And then they then when the succession changes, let's say it shifts to Arian because Daron's died. All of a sudden, they're not in the line. Their kid's not in the front line anymore. Um, I tend to say this is a more of a remote idea because I don't know that they would have gotten such a fancy marriage. But on the other hand, this is this is how you wipe out past enmity. You know, you do these marriages. Um, but again, Blood Raven, make hard. Yeah, they but that, do that doesn't fit in with the, the Stanish, Stanis, Stanis ish. <laughs> That's a tough word. Nature <laughs> of Makar's reign. Yeah, I tend to lean. He doesn't on seem the type to to reach out to the peaks. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. It, it maybe you know, maybe it was uh, a lesser marriage like that one. I could see maybe fitting. Like, I definitely don't think there's any way they would get like the top prince or princess the one that's in the direct line but maybe a lesser one still even that's a stretch in a different realm in a different regime absolutely possible but i, I tend to agree that blood raven Makar is maybe one of the least likely times for something like that to happen but we got to consider it as a possibility um so and another house it doesn't come up you mentioned maybe the reason the peak got in such troubles they went straight for high god or something like that and that's interesting we don't hear about the tyrells during this at all now we're short on yeah, details think that they still. would be involved given that they were you know lords paramount of the south uh sorry wardens of the south lord paramount of the reach you know high marshal etc cetera, etc cetera. like this is happening right on their doorstep and we don't hear and like the most prominent members of the siege are all westermen mm. yeah yeah uh that is really interesting yeah isn't it because yeah the, the, that's something we're going to get to in the second half here we talk about so many key deaths that happened in this event but yeah a lot of them were they're mostly westermen and makar himself so yeah where are the key reachmen in all this maybe some of them were on the side of the peaks or they just stayed neutral they just didn't want to take a side um or they were able to do like a lot of houses did during the rebellion or various rebellions they said oh they made up an excuse <laughs> they're like ah winters hit us too hard or yeah the the gray plague got us the plague. yeah there's a lot of excuses around this era probably that could work out um and this is where I want to get back into the discussions of honor and how honor dictated a lot of the events that we're about to get to. Whatever the reasons the peaks rebelled or uprose, whatever you term you prefer, their sworn vassals and sworn men were bound by honor to obey, even if it was the dumbest rebellion ever, right? Uh, even if we're even if all these reasons we thought up don't have much to do with it and it was really just stupid the peak just like the lord peak at the time was just a pure blind idiot and he went <laughs> and he went for it for a bunch of bad reasons things that were that we've overestimated that he overestimated even more yet his men still had to follow him i mean and that's that's too bad for them so fast forward to the storming of star pike what could have been just a siege that eventually they're like okay you got us we're out of food we gotta we gotta surrender we we held out well, or we aren't gone cowards the other way. we didn't give up easily because that's important in westeros you know 
standing tall, not giving up easily. But because the siege lingered, for whatever reason, it enabled this tragic event, which was, well, let's have a quote. This is, again, from the perspective of the West, not from the Reach. It comes from the extended version of the Westerland's history in the world of ice and fire. Pierced through with a spear as he clambered through the broken gates of Starpike, Tywald died in the arms of his twin brother, Tion, who was serving as a squire to Prince Aegon Targaryen, King Makar's youngest son. The prince, it is said, fulfilled Tywald's last request and dubbed him a knight as he was dying. King Makar himself had perished less than an hour earlier. His crowned helm crushed by a rock, dropped from the battlements as he led the attack on Starpike's main gates. Others slain upon that grievous day included Lord Robert Rain. Sir Roger Rain, the Red Lion, his eldest son and heir, took a bloody vengeance after the battle, slaying seven captive peaks before Prince Aegon arrived to halt the slaughter. So Makar was already leading attack on the gates. He apparently was like, all right, we're not going to keep the siege going too long because, as we said, winter, maybe they can't feed their army. They can't just sit there forever. Even if they had broken down the gates, they probably wouldn't have been so brutal, though. It was be because of the death of the king, I think, is why. I mean, I don't think you have seven captive peaks get killed if King Makar isn't killed. Or maybe you do because in the Rogers case, he was mad about his father's death. On the other hand, would his yeah. father have even died if Makar had died? I get the feeling that a lot of powerful lords, a lot of big names, joined the storming of the gates after Makar was killed. Whereas before, that's the kind of thing you tend to leave to lesser men. On the other hand, if Makar is in the front himself, then the other lords are going to be with him. So where do you fall on this? Uh, like, what's your headcanon for what was basically happening here of the moment Makar was killed, if you have any... So, I think the storming was probably due to necessity. Mm -hmm. I think the winter meant that they were running out of food to continue the siege. And rather than risk a defeat, they just said, all right, we're just going to go for it. Yeah. Um... And Makar just gets unlucky. Um, you know, or the defenders get lucky. And I think it it led to a, a sort of leadership vacuum. Mm. I get the sense that, like, Roger Rain's bloody vengeance is at least in part because no one's really in charge at the moment. Oh, good point. You know, the the only person who comes close is is a, is Egg. Yeah. And Egg is of you know, he's a prince, but he's not the crown prince. Right. You know, that's so yeah, that's difficult. He's not necessarily the man in charge. He has authority, but not necessarily absolute authority, and that's a Interesting point, too. I mean, everyone there, other than those blinded by bloodlust or the, the immediate things that, that just happened in the immediate aftermath, like anyone with their with their wits about them is going to go, OK, this succession crisis that's been building for 12 years under this guy's reign has now come to a full head. Yeah, we got to finish this this storming of this castle. Yeah, we got this to deal with. But we need to get back to King's Landing quickly here and get this figured out. I mean, the Great Council happens the same year. It's it's later the same year, overseen by Blood Ravens. It, it kicked off quickly. Um, yeah, it makes you wonder how early in the year this was. Yeah, yeah, it all happened in one takes, year. Yeah, because it takes time for for a Great Council to gather. That's true. So it must have, this this must have happened pretty early in the year. Um, Probably in the first six months. Yeah. So. What will uh, become the Great Council 233 overseen by Blood Raven? Of course, we've discussed that before. But thinking of in the moment, Makar is killed. You're Egg. You're his son. What's your reaction? 
uh, knowing what we know about him. And Dunk is there, too, most likely. I mean, I can't. it's hard to imagine Dunk isn't there with Egg. That's, just some, that's almost entirely out of the question. So what do they do? Do they go charging into the fray saying, you, you, killed, our, you killed my father? You know, I'm in this, for, you know, I got an honor bound to, to respond. Are the other lords doing that same thing? Um, is, is his death part, basically what I'm building to is, it sounds like the death of Makar, besides leading to the obvious death of Seven Peaks and a lot of dead defenders, probably the rush to get revenge or to settle the honor of the blood debt caused even more lords to get killed like this this ty- young tywald uh maybe lord robert rain some of these others um i get the sense that maybe this wouldn't have happened um if, if makar hadn't died what do you think about that or am i maybe exaggerating or, or what do you think um it's quite a possibility i mean you get the sense that you know Anytime that you're trying to fight through a check a choke point, yeah, like the broken gates of Starpike, that increases the the danger for the people who are in the forlorn hope. Yeah. Um and you know, the fact that Tyon and Tywald were both there on the scene, and so was Egg. Because Egg is right there on the spot to to dub Tywald the Knight as yeah. he's dying. So Egg is there in the breach. You know, this could have gone much worse. Yeah. Like imagine wow. Egg dies too. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and to to make sure some of these connections are clear, of course, Egg is still connected to uh, the Lannister family, Gerald the Golden, who is, you know, related to some of these. He's the he's the younger uh, brother of Tion and Tywald, or sorry, the, the father of Tion and Tywald and Tytos and Jason. He is the one that supposedly bribes a bunch of people that is the main voice that leads to Egg becoming king. And these connections obviously existed before that. Obviously, Egg is already uh, has one of them as a squire. And the other is a squire for a reign. So these 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 connections were there. These uh, existing relationships were there, and they were sundered by all these deaths. So not only mm-hmm. is Makar's death a huge deal, but these other deaths are a big deal, and that's going to be a big part of uh, what we're going to discuss in the second half of this episode. Mm-hmm. And of course, all this lines up. It says an hour earlier, King Makar dies, right? So and Tywald stumbles, you know, cr- clambers through the gates, it says, and gets pierced by a spear. Uh, So if Tywald is going through, that makes sense why those reins were there. He's a squire to them. So, yeah, they're all charging through. And it's it's a it's a pretty big deal to think about this. Um, Think about medieval armies. Think about ancient armies and the whole law of what you do to a captured city. It applies somewhat here, meaning that a lot of times the rule tended to be unwritten rule was if you surrender before the ram touches the gates, you uh, you can expect reasonable treatment if you surrender. If they start, if you, if you make them try, then they're going to do their worst. It, it, there's this back and forth as to what's acceptable behavior. And if there's a, a few things that if these uh, lines are crossed, anything goes. One of those lines is, like we said, if, you know, uh, holding out too long or, or killing someone. So killing the king is about as is certainly on that list. If you kill the king, it kind of makes it okay for people to do their worst to you. I- I'm not agreeing with that. I'm just saying that's how it how it seems to be. Yeah, well, right? that's how seven captive peaks wind up dead. Normally, you, you can know? never do that. That's like a horrible violation of honor, right? But because the king's yeah, dead, but, yeah. Yeah, you know, you get the sense that the the people around Roger Rain weren't holding him back. Yeah. No one's gonna that stop. They were him, just you know. <laughs> they they had taken the opinion, you know, well, the castle resisted, they they get whatever's coming to them. Yeah, they resisted and they killed the king. I mean, it's a double whammy, I think. Just you were you were you're traitors, you made us do all this fighting, and you killed the king. I mean, yeah, they really if I was a peak inside that castle, I would not have expected any I would have, yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't expect much in terms of mercy there, and indeed it doesn't seem to be. Only egg apparently kept it from getting worse if he stopped seven actual peaks from being killed i mean what were what was being done to the other people in the castle probably pretty bad things too right i mean who was gonna who mm-hmm. was stopping the the kitchen people from being assaulted or the the 
just random children running around that had nothing to do with anything. Yeah, it was probably awful. Okay, um, let us hit our mid-roll here. Let's do our drawing, shall we? Uh, let's check. Um, Ashe is going to check the, the email account, see what kind of do a drawing. And uh, I'll and we'll, me and Stephen will take a question here while she's uh, processing that because it it's going to take her a minute or two. Here is a, uh, a thought from a regular in our Facebook group, MD Cesar St. Prue. I hope I said your name close to right. I apologize if not. I've only ever seen it written before. He says, to me, Makar also has parallels with Daemon Targaryen, a very military-minded younger brother who is forever in his older brother's shadow, but who ends up saving the realm and his family, though he's greatly misunderstood by most. Also, he reminds me of Viserys II, who both saved the realm in their youth, but also had older brothers who made rule of the realm difficult due to their perception with the small folk, like Aegon V, who was a force hunter, came to power and really wasn't expected to. Yeah, that's some good points there. Aegon V is called Aegon the Unlikely because he's the fourth son of a fourth son. But Makar is that first fourth son, so he is pretty unlikely too. That was never expected to rule, um, which is maybe part of why he had a, a wife from Dorne. Um, more of a bring them into the fold rather than promote them to the top spot kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I like that Makar to Damon parallel. I mean, they have different personalities, but yeah, they, it, it, they have character and disposition are different, but in terms of their position in the family, inheritance, circumstances, their abilities, yeah. That's a pretty good. That's a good, good, pretty parallel. What, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, to me, their their personalities are are a little too divergent. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> to make that a good parallel, they're just very different people. Yeah. Um. You know. Um. I I see Viserys the second as working a little bit better. Yeah, that does work pretty well. Those personalities are a lot closer. I mean, Viserys as a king didn't last very long, but he was a hand for 20 years. and That's another one where circumstances make Viserys II seem a lot like Tywin, a lot of similar aspects to their family and upbringing and parenting and children, but actual personality, not so much necessarily. Cool, all right. Uh, one other question before we do the drawing. Matt Reese says, could a great council have been planned already? to take place since the uprising was over, given there was a question of succession. Maybe, in other words, was Bloodraven perhaps having that in the back of his mind? Was he thinking, well, this might be necessary? He may have been planning to uh, do that. Um, it may have been in the back of his mind. I like that I idea, mean, like thinking does, ahead. Yeah, what do you think? It does take a good deal of preparation to, to do one of these great councils. Yeah. You know, well, you, yeah. Have to, you have to send ravens to every house and wet noble house in westeros you know you need to to find a venue that can hold the retinues of all of the great houses of westeros and some of them might so, be kind of wary of coming without a large retinue <laughs> like like unwin peak well, yeah and we know that <laughs> the, the that the lannisters and the tyrells had large retinues yeah huge really and this is still winter, so that's tricky, right? Like we're still, even though this event is over, King, it is winter at King's Landing. So yes, yeah, sending the ravens out and making the travel, which is all is to say that it's really likely this uprising was really quick. <laughs> this was about as quick as possible um, because this whole thing happened in the span of a year. Arguably, if George were to go into greater detail here, he might decide actually this happened in late two two thirty two. The uprising happened a little. He might he might expand the range a little bit on these things without, you know, without it being much of. Well, a or the Great Council happened towards the very end of two thirty three. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much has to, huh? Okay, so the winner of the. $50 indefinite membership to Patreon. Thank you to Tommy Pappas and the TKOK Podcast Network for this. The winner is drum, drum roll, da, 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 Diana Serrano. Congratulations, Diana. Contact us. Uh, we have your email and we'll sort that out with you after the episode. Congratulations. We're going to be doing another giveaway, a different type of giveaway on our next live stream. It's kind of our holiday season thing. Uh, so stay tuned for our next episode um, for details about that. But let's get back to the content. Also, we've talked about the, uh, just as an aside, little detail here. Um, 
We've talked about the meta behind House Peak and the Gorman Gast series, Mervyn Peak. Star Pike is also a reference, according to the wiki, uh, to Steer Pike, a character in that same uh, series, the Gorman Gast novels. So that's cool. Okay. Let us start our second half with succession crises and difficulties and a quote read by Shea. The chaos caused by the death of King Makar I during the storming of Star Pike has been abundantly chronicled elsewhere, so we need not treat of it here. Suffice it to say that the matter of succession was so tangled that the king's hand, Lord Brynden, Bloodraven Rivers, summoned a great council to settle the issue. The assembled nobles, swayed in no small part by the eloquence and some suggest the gold of Lord Gerald the Golden, ultimately awarded the Iron Throne to Prince Aegon, who would rule the Seven Kingdoms for the next 26 years as King Aegon V, the Unlikely. So that quote is also from the extended Westerlands uh, section, which you can find on George's uh, website. Uh, the, the version that's published in the World of Ice and Fire is a bit shorter. This is the unabridged section. Now, I'm not actually clear on what parts are missing from uh, the abridged version. So uh, you may find the exact same phrase in the World of Ice and Fire version. But just in case, if you find a missing sentence here or there, that's why. So I underlined the phrase abundantly chronicled elsewhere. That's George's code for I'm going to write about this later. I don't want to write myself in a corner. It's pretty much the exact same phrasing he did for Blackfire 3, isn't it, Stephen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> abundantly chronicled my butt. It's not abundantly chronicled at all. So, but that is good news. Hopefully, if George has time for that one day, he'll uh, we'll get more news on that. Maybe in Fire and Blood 2, if we ever get that far. So, uh, let's talk about specifics, though. Other succession crises, difficulties. Um, obviously, for the Iron Throne, is a big deal. The peaks have never been the same again. I mean, <laughs> seven dead peaks does seem to... They probably didn't kill just the youngest ones. It's probably the oldest working their way down or something like that. But they do, they do still exist, right? There's still peaks out there. Star Pike is still ruled by them, which is kind of odd, maybe. But maybe uh, it's because so many peaks were killed. They're like, well, we would have taken yeah. your castle away, but instead we slaughtered your family. So we'll just leave that. <laughs> is that was that kind of how you read it? Yeah, I think that's basically the case that it was such an egregious act of violence, the killing of captives. Again, the breach of the of the um, cannons of war that they sort of felt that they couldn't really uh also take away the castle that that would be viewed as too bloodthirsty too tyrannical yeah i agree with that totally it, it is, it's it's seven peaks we don't know what kind of like what age they were it's entirely possible some of these were young like if not maybe even children which would make it even worse and that would be the kind of thing they would maybe keep on the down low a bit uh, so maybe some land was taken away, though. That would explain why they still have their castle but have lost a lot of power and status would be would be because they have lost more land, kind of like what happened with Harrenhal. Uh, like what happened with the Conningtons. Ah, yes. Great example. The Conningtons. Yeah. On the other hand. Let's let that siren go away. <laughs> Oh, he's yeah. muted. Sorry. Oh, I have him muted when he's not talking because of the siren right oh, now. Oh, okay. So, so no one, I'm the only one who can hear the siren. Just don't have Steven talk. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So, but there's also peaks in the Golden Company. So that's what I wanted to get at. There's peaks still at Star Pike, but there's peaks in the Golden Company. So some people in the Golden Company are out there going, well, I want to get my family castle back. So what's going on with these peaks? What are they trying to get back? Are they in league with their... Westerosi based peaks or are they going to try to usurp their cousins what do you think about that Stephen? it's kind of kind of confusing yeah it's it's an ambiguous uh situation they they could be looking to gain the other cat the other lost cat you know the two lost castles back um they could be a different branch of the peak family yeah like maybe the seven peaks who were killed wiped out the main branch and you're left with sort of feuding cousins. That makes sense. There's still 
like their old blood still carries some power in social circles. Uh, uh, the current Lord Peak is named Titus, which is, by the way, for those of you interested in the meta, that is the name. The main character of the Gormenghast series is Titus. So he's married to Margot Lannister, a, who we don't know what who Margot is. She's probably not a Lannister of Casterly Rock. She's probably a Lannister of Lannisport, but she might be a Lannister of of Casterly Rock. And if they're still getting marriages like that, then people still respect the ancientness of their family. They do still, you know, claim descent from Floris the Fox. And there's a bunch of famous peaks, even though they've fallen in, in status, that old blood is, man, that is really still very powerful social currency in Westeros, even when you've fallen from grace. So we can't undervalue that, even though it seems like they're not what they used to be. There's still maybe a little more there than we think. So maybe we'll figure out what happens there. Maybe we'll, we'll get more about that um, in the next books, but, it seems like the Peaks are, are maybe not big players, but they're definitely still involved. Um, George didn't insert them for nothing. So we have some other questions, too. Um, when was this marriage made? When was this Margot Lannister P Lord Peak marriage made? Was it Mary? Was it done? Uh, Nina gives us a, a few options to consider to sort of get the, the theory juices flowing here. Um, was it made during the reign of Jaehaerys II? Uh, after all, consider Tywald Lannister dies at Starpike. So you, yet you have a Lannister marrying a peak. <laughs> so that something happened, There's right? Montagues I mean, and Capulets. Hmm. Uh, or could it have been during the reign of the Mad King when the peaks were trying to regain some former status? Maybe marrying, maybe Tywin decides to bring them into the fold perhaps as a part of his bulwark against Ares. Uh, after all, Tywin wasn't sure which way the, the winds were going to blow there. Um, or maybe right after Robert's Rebellion. Uh, the Reach was not on Robert's side. They were mostly for the Targaryens. So maybe uh, a few marriages to ancient houses within the Reach might help shore up that new loyalty. Uh I like that idea, or maybe it was during Robert's reign because there were so many Lannisters. Well, you know, tie your family, tie your royal family to as many houses as possible to to shore up as much support as possible. Stephen, any of those theories jump out as you as more likely than others, or or maybe um, I like one? the reign of Jaehaerys the second. Yeah, okay. Maybe that part of that blood. strikes me as as uh, a marriage made as. Uh, a sort of a peace agreement because hmm. the reins it's a vassal like a, a the reins were heavily tied to the lannisters at this time and if so there the reins crime against the peaks might be the shame of that might be shared by their in-laws the lannisters and their overlords since the reins are vassals of the lannisters so that that checks uh, that checks out that you know as far as westerosi ethics yeah that's a good point i hadn't thought of that entangling connection there uh, that makes a lot of sense speaking of these entanglements so we'll talk about entanglements indirectly these deaths would set in motion the events that destroyed house rain and house tarback the infamous reigns of castamir saga which brings us to another nice lengthy quote to set that up take it away shea Less well known, but no less baleful. All, less well known, but no less baleful are the dire effects the battle would have upon the history of the West. Tywald Lannister had long been betrothed to the Red Lion's spirited young sister, Lady Ellen. This strong-willed and hot-tempered maiden, who had for years anticipated one day being the Lady of Casterly Rock, was unwilling to forsake that dream. In the aftermath of her betrothed's death, she, per she persuaded his twin brother, Tion, to set aside his own betrothal to a daughter of Lord Rowan of Golden Grove and espouse her instead. Lord Gerald, it is said, opposed this match and did what he could to forbid it, but grief and age and illness had left him a pale shadow of his former self, and in the end, he gave way when his son Tion revealed that his brother had pleaded with him to, quote, take care of Lady Ellen with his last words. In 235 AC, in a double wedding at Casterly Rock, 
Ser Tion Lannister took Ellen Rain to wife, whilst his meek younger brother, Titos, wed Jane Marbrand, a daughter of Lord Denys Marbrand of Ashmark. So Lord Gerald was right to oppose that match. If he had successfully opposed it, it may have ev- avoided the entire Reigns of Castamere situation. So <laughs> Ellen marries Tion, or Tyon, we're not sure how to say it, doesn't really matter, would be just would die three years later, or one year later, act three years after the peak uprising, one year after this marriage. So Ellen marries the heir to Castle or is, marries the heir to Castle Rock. He dies. She marries the next heir to Castle Rock. He dies. If you think she's done, she's not. She actually tried to move in on Titos, but Jane Marbran wasn't having it. She's like, back off. This is my heir to Castle Rock. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ha- give birth to Tywin and all these other kids. And a lot of this is something we'll talk about later. It's certainly worth an episode to get into the reigns of Castamere in greater detail, but we're, we just want to talk about the fallout here. So don't forget El- Rohan Weber vanished in 230 and was presumed long dead. So that's part of the grief Lord Gerald is, is suffering because that's his wife that vanished. And now he's got his twins uh, have died within a couple years. And apparently he's been sick. And he'd been sick. Yeah. I so I never really noticed that just by the way that he was sick. Yeah. And, he, but he lived until 244. So he got, Basically, when Tywald died, it, it, it crushed him a bit. But when Tion died, he, he found his strength. It's kind of like Rhaenyra, mm-hmm. how first death crushed her. The second death made her angry and got her going. Uh, pretty similar to that. So um, when Titus inherits after Gerald's death, that, mean, that meant Lady Jane would be Lady of the Rock. And uh, yeah, there was lots of going back and forth until Lord Gerald finally had enough. And to get rid of Lady Ellen, uh, he had her, gave her a third husband since she was unmarried, and it was to a Tarbeck. It's a second husband, technically. Oh, that's true. The other one was never actually she, finished. Yeah, she it never was betrothal. Married. You're right. She yeah. didn't actually marry Tywald. He was betrothed. That's true. So, uh, same difference, basically. But she did actually marry this Lord Tarbeck, and that's how the Reigns and Tarbecks got connected to leading to all that. So, yes. Anything to add to this, Stephen? What are your, uh, what are your thoughts on I mean, this, this much? I, I think the the death of Tyon is instrumental in causing the reigns of Castamere because I think it made Ellen sort of what's the right word jealous fearful mm. you know this this had been like a well established. Uh, you know, alliance between the two families, right? It was yeah. A long Tywald engagement. was Lord Robert Rain's squire. The Rand- Lannisters and Reigns seemed to be getting along just fine before all this, like well, not just fine, but like well, right? And so, you know, it was a case of like lifelong expectations suddenly uprooted, and it produced in her uh, a sort of aggressive tendency Mm, yeah and you sort of think you know if if the storming of star pike hadn't happened maybe the reigns of castamere wouldn't have happened because ellen would be less um she would have just been yeah she would have just been the lady of castle rock she wouldn't have had to fight for it i mean maybe she would have been a really terrible lady of castle rock but she wouldn't have had to intrigue for it (laughs) she would have just been it yeah (laughs) i mean she was apparently good at the job yeah you're right she was that's one of the shames of the reigns of castamere is that like ellen rain was good as a ruling lady of casterly rock yeah that's a good point yeah that is kind of overlooked that she did seem to like while she was kind of de facto in charge it wasn't official that she was in charge but she was effectively because titos was just kind of like eh, and gerald was doing other stuff or or both and yeah yeah that's a good point yeah she did, she did a better job than titos did it seems <laughs> um yeah that gets overlooked i think so that's a that's an important aspect but yeah i guess part of the lannister feeling on this was she was also really favoring her own family a bit and they were a little threatened by that certainly that's what tywin didn't like that part um not sure how much yeah, threat. Yeah, I mean really it's ironic were, but... given that Tywin promoted the same phenomenon, you know, with his daughter and Robert Baratheon. It's like 
you know, was was Ellen doing something beyond the bounds or was this just what what an ambitious in-law does? Mm, yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> That's true. I mean, and, and we also have to consider that the Reigns and Lannisters have probably intermarried so many times before that, too. This was probably a long running like they're the number two house in the West. Like it was number two marrying number one. It's kind of like uh, a lot of other regions where the number two and number one either get along or don't like in, in Dorne, Ironwood and Martell have kind of been fighting a lot. But even in current times, there was, you know, in the last hundred years or so until the Red Vipers incident, there was I mean, Quentin was fostered with the Ironwood. So clearly things were going going a lot better, even though that was part of because of Oberyn's thing. So <laughs> still, mm -hmm. still, it's an improvement of, of, the, of the status quo. But this is the an example of the status quo turning very sour and getting very bloody later. But like I said, we'll we'll talk in more detail about the reigns of Castamere later. But as you can see, it is very well set up here. I don't know about very well, but <laughs> it was set up here. <laughs> Badly set up here. <laughs> Um, let's divert for a moment to talk about a historical parallel, meaning a real world historical parallel. F the famous king of England, Richard the Lionheart, was also killed in a fairly meaningless siege with a outcome that was basically predetermined. The castle where it happened wasn't super important. The, the event itself wasn't that important, but the fact that he died was extremely important. Uh... Richard, too, was a warrior king and had a shaky success and succession situation, didn't he? You, you know a few things about this, don't you? Yeah, I mean, Richard had no sons. Yeah. Um, now, folks, so, if you don't remember, folks, the guy who preceded or who came after Richard the Lionheart was the infamous King John, the one featured in the Robin Hood stories, the one who was voted one of the worst Britons of all time. <laughs> I personally think there it's in a little bit of an exaggeration, but he was terrible. <laughs> he was terrible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's bad. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, especially... You know, with the case of Richard, he was besieging a castle that was practically unarmored. Yeah. Yeah, apparently there's a story about the guy who shot him with the crossbow bolt was one of the only two knights in the whole castle. And he was using a frying pan as part of his armor because, like you said, they had so little time to prepare. Richard got there so quickly they weren't ready for it and they didn't maybe didn't even think he was coming. And there's another parallel here. Uh, Richard said don't kill the guy that shot me. You know, he saw it coming. He saw them being vicious towards this castle. And he's like, don't do it. Don't do it. The, the crossbow boat didn't kill him. The, the infection did. But it was pretty quick. So it didn't instantly kill him like it was with Makar. So instead of, so he's sort of playing the role of Aegon here, but in reverse. Aegon saying, don't kill them. But in this case, the person saying, don't kill them dies and no one listens. So the guy who yeah. shot Richard, apparently, despite Richard's pardon, was flayed alive and then hanged by Richard's mercenary captain. That is a bad way to go. That is, you really, it's hard to imagine worse. Yeah. So, um, that's bad. And that reminds us of that. So I imagine George took some real world, some inspiration from that event. Um, not unlikely. Anyway. Let's move on. Of course, we've also referred in the past a few times, it's worth comparing as well, the, the peak uprising to the Jacobite rebellions, as Nina points out aptly, uh, particularly in 1689 and 1715. Um, the, in 1715, pro-Jacobite landowners and aristocrats attempted to raise the standard of the Jacobite claimants, James II and Seventh, and the so-styled James III and Eighth, respectively. This gets confusing with all the titles. As confusing as Aegon's and Daron's are, it's, the real world is worse. Although neither rebellion actually really featured the Jacobite claimants, people were fighting sort of in their names. Uh, I, I'm not super well versed on the Jacobite rebellions. I know Nina very well is, but I think you know a few things about them as well. Did you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, you know, the Jacobites, I think, work as a good parallel for the Blackfires because they're kings over the water. Yeah. Mm. Um, they're this you know, multiple generation lasting threat to the Hanoverians. Ooh. And there were multiple Jacobite risings. There was one in 1715. 
There was one in 1719. There was one in 1745. So you're seeing the threat span, you know, decades. Yeah. Some people, I think some people in the, in the real world who uh, real readers have questioned the, the, uh, the realism of the black fires happening over such a large span, but Hey, we've got it right here in the real world. So hard to say that's unrealistic given that it's happened in the real world to, to a similar degree, at least. So let's talk about parallels to a song of ice and fire. This I think might be one of the most fun parts of the episode. So if you've stuck with us this long, well, perhaps you're in for, for some extra payoff. Uh, let's just run through a couple of quick parallels of Stannis and Makar, and then Stephen, I want to throw it over to you because I know you've got a couple of cool ideas that I've heard you talk about in the past for what you have sort of envisioned for Stannis's ending, and they're pretty similar to what I have envisioned. And there's a lot of parallel, and in those envisionings, I see a lot of similarities to what's happened with Makar here. So first, let me list off these these basics. Y'all have heard some of these before, but let's uh, let's prime ourselves, kind of get this to the front of our memories again so we've got basic similarities like physicality stannis is really tall of course he's become thin because of the the baby shadow babying but he's a big dude don't think of tv stannis book stannis is six foot four large ditto makar both of them killed their own brother in a sense as we said both of them successful in battle both of them have a sort of a, tr a literary trope child a dreamer son versus a daughter with a dreamer fool. You know, they've got these prophetic children or a daughter that has a prophetic sidekick. Uh, the, the weather thing that we talked about, that's huge. The long summer versus cruel winter. Uh, Blood Raven versus Melisandre as their sort of advisor or the, the bird on their shoulder kind of character. Uh, the disease thing, Grey Plague, Out Plague, Outbreak in Old Town versus what's going on at the Wall with Shireen's Grayscale, which currently is nothing, but Val's warning shouldn't be ignored, and it sounds like a setup for something, let alone the Grayscale showing up with John Connington. Um, Stannis never had as many children as Makar, but if Stannis dies in the midst of his army, who the heck takes over? It's going to be a similar level of chaos, like, well, who's in charge now? It's not going to be Shireen, they're not going to follow her, not in combat, they may crown her they may kneel to her but there she's not going to start issuing orders in battle especially because she's probably not even going to be there uh and she may have already been burned by this point she may already be dead so yeah uh so anyway and after the others are defeated there may be a great council again in a song of ice and fire and it might even end up with something like storm's end going to gendry like finding a descendant of the baratheons he's still out there Kind of like or how they Andrew had to do Storm. here with who is a Targaryen that we can give the throne to. All right. So that was a lot of setup. Take it away, Stephen. What do you think about Stannis's end or anything else that I just laid out there? Any other parallels you want to throw out? Be, be, feel free. I mean, I think Stannis's end in the books is going to be um, different from the show. Yeah, same. Let me, Very different. Let me yeah. put it. No. diplomatically i think he's definitely not going to kill shireen for uh i i you know for a momentary battlefield advantage yeah i think he feels that he's got the war side pretty much in hand i think he wins the battle against the boltons and takes winterfell but then Winterfell is besieged mm. by the others. Yeah. And it's a replay of uh, the Siege of Storm's End. Yeah, he's prepared for this. Where, he's done this before. Yeah. Yeah, he's done this before, but it's also a thing that forces moral decisions on him. The same way that he was... He was forced to, you know, whether to execute people or eat the dead um in the st ah, siege of storm's end yeah i think he'll be pushed by melisandre to burn shireen to wake stone dragons from winterfell yeah so and what we might see is sort of so what i'm suggesting perhaps is a little bit of the inverse we have winter at its <laughs> peak haha <laughs> and a, an, a, sie a siege in winter instead of the king being on the outside trying to get in we have the king on the inside king on the trying inside. to hold out yeah so we kind of have that re in reverse also by the way I, I almost forgot to mention nina put this in our notes here 
Makar is the great great grandfather of Stannis, so let's not forget that <laughs> they are also related. <laughs> um, another piece of evidence that Stannis will end up in Winterfell that's come along since the last time you and I talked about this theory, which I strongly agree with the the, the basic parameters of, is that we have these scenes in Fire and Blood where there's a very Stannis-like Alaric Stark having discussions with you know who's mad about how his brother died and is having discussions with. Um, the Sansa paralleled Alisanne, you know, and it just feels like this something like this could happen. Um, I don't know, maybe. So uh, definitely agree with the the general idea here. What well, just it's maybe it's a little off topic, but what do you think? St do you think? Um, how do you think the Night Fort will play into any of this? Or will it? Not um, really? <laughs> if I had to guess, it's the Night Fort that where the breach in the wall will be. Mm, okay. That makes some sense. Yeah. One perhaps last parallel between Stannis uh, and Shireen and Makar here as well would be that uh, Stannis may lose support for burning Shireen. I would guess that his, a lot of his followers won't be happy about that, especially Davos. If Davos finds out about it in, you know, in any, any timely manner, it may not he may not find out till it's well past. But regardless, Magar doesn't burn his own daughter or anything that we know of. I can't imagine he did, really. That would have probably not escaped the history books. But he does his own family does burn to death much later at Summerhall. So it's maybe a stretch to connect those two events. But still it's uh it works mm -hmm. as a little bit of a parallel. That's so much later though, so it's not really that important to talk to, to link to this. But if we really want to keep the parallels tight, we've got that going too. <laughs> Excuse me. So maybe, um, what do you figure, uh, have you, do you have any theories or ideas or things that have popped in your head as to how Stannis actually dies? Um, <laughs> given this as a clue, like Makar's death, maybe not a rock dropped on his head, but something kind of sudden, uh, something kind of out of, you know, like unexpected, not just like a heroic last stand or anything like that, maybe. Um, um, he could die in the siege. He could die at the hands of um, Daenerys, mm. right? She is a slayer of lies. If Stannis dies and there's chaos, that could be where the Sansa stuff comes into it. She might be the one that takes charge. Uh, like, it's going to be hard for St Sansa to, to really run anything at all if Stannis is in her castle and his big personality and all his troops everywhere. I mean, he's not going to just take Winterfell from her, but it's going to be like he, when he was at the Wall, where he's going to throw his weight around with Jon and be like, give me this, give me that. We're all going to die if you don't. you know. And Winterfell isn't exactly used to being run by a woman, so that might take a little time to develop. I do see it developing, but that's part of why I brought up this Alaric, Alisande stuff, because I think that might be germane. Uh, there might be a yeah, lot of parallels. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so yeah, I, I like the idea of Stannis dying suddenly. I don't like it, but I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of like a narrative device to have. Cause like who is Stannis the second in command right now in the field? Godry, the giants, like, does he even have one? <laughs> like, is it that like, <laughs> I can't identify. Yeah, Stannis hasn't really elevated anyone to be that, of uh, that position since he got rid of the Florence. Yeah. So it's a real... There is a real leadership vacuum problem that is looming over this situation that's very similar to what happened with Makar. Like we said, when Makar died, Roger Rain was able to get away with slaughtering Seven Peaks because no one could say no to him. Uh, who's going to say no to... I don't know what would happen. There's not going to be a bunch of people running wild in that kind of scenario if Stannis is dead in, in, in a similar situation because they're going to all be... It's going to be more like panic, like, oh my God... Our leader's dead. The others are coming. Like, what the hell are we going to do? Um, so that'd be Mike more of the, the fear type of like leader, the leadership to manage that massive amount of fear and anxiety and ev everyone's afraid they're going to die, uh, which is maybe the way the peaks felt <laughs> in that moment. And like, oh, my God, they're all going to kill us because of what our because we killed the king, you know, something like that. So. A lot of the same ideas kind of presented in a different order, maybe one from different characters, different perspectives. But it fits darn well. Um, I kind of skipped over, just mentioned it. But what do you think about the uh, what do you think about the grayscale stuff 
at the in the north. I'm I'm so torn on that. I I think it's a red herring. Okay. You think it'll matter in the south though? With John Connington? Um maybe not. Not in terms uh, of like a plague thing, but in terms of like do you think the whole thing is a red herring? Is that what you're saying? A gray herring? Yeah, that's kind of my, my feeling. <laughs> nice. <laughs> huh. Okay. Yeah. I, I know that's not an unpopular opinion. I think, I think you know, a few other uh, people we've had as guests, the people that I respect their opinions of have said that. And, you know, a lot of people have that opinion, really. Um, I think it's going to – I tend to fall the, on the other way on it, but obviously we'll just have to wait and see. Um Certainly the show made it look like it wasn't a big deal, but obviously we're not going to go by the show. <laughs> um, okay, what else do we have here? Um, yeah, I wonder too, like the, the whole northern leadership situation, if Stannis is able to, if the, if the north, if they break through at the night fort, let's go back to that for a second. They break through at the night fort, they make their way through, and they start to f flood the north. I guess they would probably it's it's interesting to consider the other's level of intelligence like how smart are they are they going to go straight for Winterfell or are they going to slowly just encompass the north slowly moving south just from coast to coast I've never I haven't honestly given it a lot of thought other than worrying about places like White Harbor where there's giant population centers and if they do go to White Harbor who oh boy that's really bad um, do you think the others get stopped at Winterfell, or do you think they get farther south? Yeah. You do? Okay. I think Winterfell is the place for, like, it's it's crafted to be the place where the, the final confrontation yeah. happens. Okay, so... For, like, everything about it. Yeah. It's the place with the the hot springs where they can hold out. It's the, the name. It's uh, <laughs> It's got the history. It's got the crypts in it where things can come alive if they want to go that route. Um, maybe different ways in that people don't know about. Uh, Brand's home, all the setup from Winterfell at the beginning. Yeah, there is a lot to suggest that. Again, um, the show as well. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I go back and forth on that. You know, so so how do you reconcile that line with Danny's vision of melting an army of ice at the Trident? Because that's one that I struggle with. I'm not sure how to reconcile those two. Uh, I think that one is more metaphorical than um. Okay. Then literal. Could it be referring to Starks? No, I I don't think she's gonna fight at the Trident. Okay. I think it's more that just the 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 major image she has of a battle at that time in her life is the battle for the Trident. Okay. Yeah. So it's just what she imagines. Yeah, that's a it, it's a whole other topic. But just to tease it, maybe to talk about the fact that the Starks do sort of represent unchanging. Uh, like st stasis and that's a very well mm. explained by the concept of ice like things stay frozen like the Starks have been in charge for so long it's been the same like no other region has that kind of through line of of stability yet that stability has also held them back uh, the north people like the north uh, for a lot of honor reasons and things that have happened during the story but it's also a more vicious brutal place it's more it's probably worse towards women in a lot of ways, if not more ways. So there's a lot of things that North is really backwards about. And that might be part of what is being, you know, expressed here that it needs to be melted a bit and broken down a bit. Pretty meta for this episode to bring that up. But I think it's, you know, it's a good topic. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if, the Starks end up being somewhat resistant to Daenerys, you know, and that becomes a whole political conflict. Yeah. I could see that happening. Yeah. I wonder if there's a little something to be said about John in this, because John, you know, John is obviously going to find out he's a Targaryen. People can find out he's a Targaryen, but ultimately I, I imagine you would agree with me and a lot of fans who say that John is still going to ultimately be, a Stark in attitude and it was his upbringing. That's the, that's the kind of person he is and that's, he's going to go more towards that side of things. Uh, so we have a character that's a Stark Targaryen. That's going to lean Stark. Well, there isn't necessarily the opposite. I mean, there isn't some other John 
identical twin who has, you know, who's going to lean the other way. So I, I kind of think about that and I kind of come up empty with that one. But I think it's an interesting line of thinking. Maybe just something that George has in the back of his mind or maybe it's in a, a thread that he decided not to pursue. I don't know. But it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, OK, well, I guess we can start to wrap things up. Um, we uh, okay. got through this pretty well. A lot of great theories, a lot of great ideas. I'm curious to see. We're going to have to take a look back at this when the Winds of Winter comes out and see how some of these parallels lined up and see if it was uh, kind of what we thought. Or if, Surely there'll be some big surprises. I imagine we're going to be like, yep, saw that one coming, though, and a few spots will be nodding our heads like, yep, <laughs> that's what we said. <laughs> but they'll, like I said, there'll be a lot of huge surprises, too. How does this plot line, like the Stannis in the North plot line, like rank rank for you in terms of things you're like most excited for? Is it like the top or kind of in the middle or it's, is it? It's, do you have a favorite plot line? Just because I've um, I've made a fairly bold prediction as to how I think it's going to happen, okay. so I want to see whether I'm right or wrong. <laughs> right on. Yeah, that does that does add a little low extra to it. Like you got a little. It's sort of like having a wager on it, yeah. <laughs> That's cool, yeah. I'm I'm super excited for it too because the North is where we have. Uh, right now, we've been working on a brand in the Builder episode, and that just gets really deep into ancient North stuff. That's kind of why my mind is on these like Stark as a whole concept. Um, what does Brandon the current have to do with Brandon the Builder, and what is you know Brandon the Rebuilder concepts like that, like all the stuff that comes after the Long Night. So it's pretty pretty interesting to think about how Stannis slash Makar, his his uh, predecessor, uh, for lack of a better term, his ancestor, um, played things similarly. So it also serves as a nice parallel. You got one of those happening in the far north, the other one happening in the far south. So there's a little bit of location uh, parallelism going on there too. Okay, so Stephen, what is uh, what's coming up next for you? What are you you working on? You just finished Purple uh, Wedding, so I guess you just got the next chapter. Uh, Sense of Five. Cool. Well, now, which one is Sense of Five? That's that's her the one away. where uh, her escape from King's Landing. Yeah. Okay. So the big she gets the big reveal that uh, Littlefinger is there, and um, she gets to see Dantos get shot in front of her because he's not mm -hmm. very bright. <laughs> And yeah, so uh, cool. Well, let's um, give you a big thanks. Appreciate you coming on the show again. It's always a great time My chatting pleasure. with you. And we'll uh, we'll have you back on another time when we maybe have another related topic or when we have something like this to circle back to discuss. Maybe we'll have, if, if not during the winds of winter, then something sooner. Uh, yeah, so thanks to everyone who came to uh, watch this live stream. Um, we'll, like I said, we'll have another one in a couple weeks with another giveaway. We'll be getting back to regular Sunday live streams in January with the World of Ice and Fire. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, thanks to Nina for the notes. We used quite a few of them this time. Some good questions and some good theories laid out that we were able to play with. Thank you to our mods over on our Facebook group, History of Westeros Facebook group pretty active spot if you want to get involved lots of discussions oh look at that we got super chat from here be dragons can't wait to rewatch wish i could stick around but gotta get ready for my stream love the new look steven uh steven from steven there we go <laughs> steven stark to steven atwell how nice uh here be dragons is starting at six the new eastern look, by the way is that Steven's beard is mighty white. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Steven, I can't see you. I don't yeah, he can't see you, yeah. but if anyone who's listening is wondering, well, what on earth could this be? It's that he has a snow he's a snow white little little goatee beard. That sounds like a good look. You got a little, yeah. little, little, little snowman going, a little snow beard going, huh? Mm -hmm. King Steven Snowbeard. That's cool. Also, shout out to those of you who uh, interact with us on uh, Discord or any of the other spots that we get going. Discord's rising as our most popular spot for hanging out besides Facebook. Uh, thanks as well to Michael Clarfeld, a.k.a. Claradox.de. He has a new short film out called Hunger. Uh, it's a, a spoof on uh, the murder mystery genre. Um, instead of a murder, it's a stolen sandwich. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. Check it out. Uh, we'll, we'll post links in our social media outlets so you can check it out on Facebook. Uh, 
can come find the link over on Facebook or just go to Michael's Twitter or uh, ask him directly. Go to uh, claridox.de. Find it for yourself as well as all his maps and great stuff there. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for the Val Arboretus music. Thanks to Joey Townsend and Jesse Koval for our regular History of Westeros music. Thanks to the Benjineer for his audio quality assistance. Uh, here be dragons who the Stephen to Stephen comment. They are starting at six, like I said. They're they're gonna take on what we do in the shadows. Season one, season three of what we do in the shadows just came out. Shay and I are big fans of that show, so I highly recommend you watch that show if you haven't. And yeah, if you va- have, check out Stephen. Yeah, it's a vampire mockumentary on yeah. FX. It's, it's quite funny. funny. Have you watched it? What we do in the shadows, Stephen? Um, I've watched bits and pieces. Okay, cool. Yeah. Highly recommended. Good stuff for everybody else who hasn't checked it out. And me and Ashea are going to be in WorldCon for, uh, or in DC for WorldCon in December. WorldCon isn't usually in December, but it is this year for reasons you can probably figure out that rhyme with mandemic uh, or Ovid. So um, if you're going to be there, let us know. It's going to be fun. Um, Probably smaller than usual, but lots of great panels and uh, you can come say hi to us. Yeah, we'll be taking it pretty easy, but there are some nice authors that'll be there, like Rebecca Roanhorse and Shannon Chakraborty, Rebecca Kwong. Um, so it should be a good time. Yep. So if you're in the area, especially if you're attending the con, reach out to us, westeroshistory at gmail.com, or join us on Discord or Facebook and hit us up there. Uh, keep, on, keep a lookout. Within the next few weeks, we'll be dropping not only our Brandon the Builder episode, but an episode on Balerion. And we will be also releasing a patrons-only episode on Johanna Lannister. Not Joanna Lannister, Johanna Lannister, meaning the one who stood up to the Red Kraken. And that is a companion episode to our already released Red Kraken episode with Radio Westeros, which is available for patrons only. Or if you sent a donation, you can get it that way. That also gives you access to all of our (laughs) other bonus episodes. That includes the episode on Gagasos, the City of Blood Magic, and... Uh, some other chapter-ish episodes and some other ones that are escaping my mind at the moment. But our bonus episode catalog is growing all the time. And the price to get them remains the same for now. We're going to increase it at some point. But for now, you can get it at the same price it always is, which is, I believe, the lowest is $2 a month. So that's pretty good. Lots of bonus episodes for $2 a month. Get on that if you're so inclined. If not... That's cool, too. We'll see you next time for more History of Westeros. You know what to do. Valar, reread us.